So yes, yeah, so my name's Elliot Whittington. I am the director of CLG Europe, which is one of the partner groups within the Women Business Coalition. And working within, within the EU, we have been running a project called the Materials of Project Task Force. It's actually on the list just outside the room, for those of you who have taken a moment to read that. Um, and it's apparently we produce unsafe slide sets, so we, we'll need to work on that. Um, so I'm very pleased, and we have some key important guests who will help us talk about this. We launched the Materials and Products Task Force uh, at COP26 last year, um, and we have run... I'm going to go back for a second. And we've been able to run this as a kind of dialogue between European businesses and European policymakers, exploring how materials and products can be transformed. They, we can accelerate and grow the market for new, low-carbon, more sustainable materials and products. And the key thing that we want to talk to you about today is how circularity and climate change come together. A, re a really important subject. So, you know, many businesses will talk about the circular economy as a, a key strategy in the industrial sector. Um, and obviously, we're here at a whole discussion, which is all around climate action. But sometimes these two conversations don't, aren't unified enough. The circularity is a really important strategy, but it needs to be a strategy that is following up on, on a key goal. And uh, so, so what we have been trying to do is talk about how these things relate together. So the team has put together a very good agenda. Unfortunately, because we're slightly... So if timings and guests are not with it, this is indicative rather than exact. But broadly speaking, I'm going to introduce you to our work. And then we have speakers including Anthony Abbott from Rockwell, Helen Ochen, um, uh, Oglund from, from uh, the Ministry of Environment in Sweden and hopefully Vincente uh, Saison from CMEX who will hopefully join us uh, as we, we move on um, and a respondent with Chiara Martinelli from, from Can Europe. So we will we'll have that conversation and we hope we'll use the next t uh, 40 minutes well to kind of talk about this subject. But if you, if you stick with me, I just want to talk about the, the, the report that we have recently been able to launch. So... Um, Europe has, I mean, it's interesting, actually, if I, if I think about the keynote, the really interesting keynote from the previous session, um, one of the kind of lessons from that was that um, whilst there is a long way to go and whilst there is a huge kind of justice concern, the European countries are some of the most successful in terms of decarbonising. Um, there is a lot more that needs to be done. Um, so Europe has made great strides on its climate action, but there is a lot further to go on, on the circularity. A lot of climate action so far has been focused on key sectors like transport and energy and if we look at particularly the industrial sectors and think about how those can transform then circularity comes forward as a really essential strategy a really important strategy um, so we pu recently published a briefing called green circularity it's available on the website today is the day it's launched um, and you know we have sort of identified that there is a huge opportunity in unifying these conversations and bring them together much more concertedly um, but to do that, uh, there's a need to address some of the wider issues in the conversation and resolve some of the challenges that businesses encounter when they're driving to become more circular and sustainable. Um, we also kind of noted while, when, in putting that out that the current context, the, the, the context of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, the context of high energy prices, um, actually really uh, illustrates the importance and the value of being not overly dependent on external material flows and being able to have that diversity and the efficiency that can come with circularity. So it's a, it's a really important moment and I hope you'll agree a really important message that we've been able to deliver. So we launched the task force to take this, this work forward. These are the current members. Um, we, we launched it last year with uh, six of these. So the, the group has grown by three members over the year. It's a, it's a, and it's uh, already been able to have impact in terms of driving the conversation with EU policymakers, and we've had a lot of response, particularly from the European Commission, who have, who have seen the value of this focus um, and of, of, of the work that we've been able to do. The recommendations that we came out with in this report, uh, so I talked about sort of key challenges that needed to be, to be addressed if we're able to kind of scale up circularity. One of the most important things is um, the need to be clearer on the meanings and metrics surrounding the circular economy. So it's, it's a narrative that a lot of people have adopted, have understood as being essential to, to, to move forward. But without clarity on the meanings and metrics, um, it's, it's actually difficult to work out where the pathways forward are. And so if we can have more clarity, and that needs to be set from a, from a policymaker level, from a government level, so that it's a shared clarity, that's really important. 
We've also identified the absolute importance of demand-side policy as a lever to drive change. You know, one of the things that I note within a lot of these conversations is the value of work within the business value chain, the supply chain, those kind of relationships as being critical. And there is a huge role in terms of demand-side policy for both triggering um, those value chains to transform, but also facilitating the flow of information and materials up and down that value chain. So you can check, you know, are you able to buy a truly sustainable or a zero-carbon material, or are you buying something that somebody is claiming and they don't have the clarity over what it is? So that, that, that's a really important thing. Um, we also see this is an area of innovation. We, you know, the EU has its clean uh, circular economy action plan. As it develops that and builds it, we see a huge importance in um, the role of stakeholder consul consultation. This is very much an evolving landscape, and so policymakers need to understand from the business community, from, from civil society, from other actors, how this conversation is evolving. And so the, there needs to be a live process of consultation, and that needs to really show up in the development of further legislative action. And then finally, we see um, you know, the fundamental importance of financial and investment policy in driving circularity. And we, I think we, we kind of hear about that a lot these days. You know, so the ability of ensuring that um, you know, we can have a greater understanding within the finance community of the value of circular practices and of their ability to deliver reduced risk, increased opportunity, and so therefore there are the, the importance of valuing and valuing the financial return. So those are some of the key messages that we wanted to put out there. I'm very pleased, and maybe if I could invite our, the speakers in the room, so Anthony, uh, Helen and Chiara up to join me, um, and we can just have a, a brief conversation about some of these things. Now I'm conscious Anthony is going to need to leave fairly soon, so even though we had an agenda, I'm going to slightly, yeah, please, please do take a seat. And, Maybe if I, if I can give that to you. Um, even though we had an agenda, I'm going to, we're going to slightly freestyle as we go through, if that's okay. So we'll use this as an opportunity for a useful conversation. But basically, because, because I know your time is, is somewhat limited, if we're all logistically challenged in this context, um, I wanted to start with you, Anthony, and let's start with you. Actually, you were there in Glasgow, in COP26, when we launched uh, the task force, and you've been part of it. And so can you, may, I ask you maybe to give a business perspective on yeah. how we've been able to take this conversation forward. Yeah, thanks, uh, Elliot. Um, you know, circularity is, is, is close to our hearts. And when I say our hearts, I'm coming from a company, Rockwell, uh, Danish company, family owned, um, and we're producing Stonewall around the world. Uh, Stonewall's uh, well known for its insulation uh, properties, but it's also used in in uh, other sectors, uh, horticultural substrates. Um, so, f so for us, circularity and decarbonisation, they, they, go, they go very close together. Um, I think von der Leinen, she said that 50% of the carbon reduction, carbon emission reductions that we need to achieve by 2050, it needs to come from circular business models. Um, and we work with circularity in different ways. Um, for example, our feedstock, we're utilizing 650,000 tons every year of uh, material from other industries. I don't like calling it waste uh, because we need to move away from calling it waste, uh, but upcycling that material and that's improving the energy efficiency of our processes. Um, so at the end of the day, reducing the carbon intensity of our factory. On the, other, on the other side, we're trying to bring back more material from the value chain. Um, so uh, bringing it back from the market, from the construction sites, from the demolition sites. Um, we're increasing volumes, but we're challenged. Um, and uh, some of those challenges relate to our own challenges. Uh, you know, because we're a company that is used to getting products out to market, uh, reverse logistics, that's, that's a totally different uh, ball game. And, you know, being able to work with our value chain uh, uh, partners, with waste companies, to make that happen, um, we're uh, improving for sure. We have some markets, particularly in the Nordics, 
where we have been doing this for, for uh, many, many years, a uh, much mature situation. Uh, in other markets, it's more difficult. So if we're going to drive circularity, and we're very interested as a company in doing that because it makes sense from a decarbonization perspective, it makes sense from a commercial perspective. Our customers want uh, products that, are, that have a higher recycled content that, where we're offering the service to them to get rid of their material on the construction sites. If we're able to succeed, then we need conducive conditions in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the market. Now, one example, one of the challenges relates to landfill prices because at the moment it's too cheap in a number of different markets to actually get rid of that material um, by landfilling it. So we need some economic incentives to change that cost so that suddenly it's becoming more attractive to recycle. We're seeing examples in different countries where that's happening. Germany is a very good example uh, where uh, they are banning uh, the landfilling of recyclable products uh, 2024. We're very supportive of that. What we've got to make sure is that at the same time it's proportionally uh, uh, economically less attractive to have products that aren't recyclable. Um, so that's, that's one condition, one area that, that we need to, uh, to fix. Another example, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is moving away from calling it waste and also regulating it as waste, but regulating it as a, as a, a valuable material. We're sometimes challenged uh, in transporting the material across borders. Um, and sometimes those borders uh, can be within the country. Uh, we, uh, in Spain, for example, there can be regional borders, whereas it's very, very difficult to transport that material. Um, if you start regulating it as a material, a valuable material rather than a waste, then suddenly it's much easier to transport that material and it means that we can move the material around uh, so that we, we can um, uh, send it to factories, for example, that have the capacity to, uh, to take it. So there's a couple of examples of, of the constraints that need to be uh, addressed if we're going to uh, succeed on the, on the circularity agenda. Thank you, Anthony. That's brilliant. And uh, so we'll, we'll maybe we'll hear from our two business speakers and then come to you, Helen, if that's okay. So it's a slight change in, in agenda. But I'm very grateful that uh, Vincente has been able to join us. And uh, if it's not springing on you too much, if I could ask you again. So we're, we're talking about this conversation about how circularity can really support the development of a, a more uh, ambitious climate agenda. And so to hear from you as a kind of business that's, that's kind of supporting and, and adopting that and your perspective on what policy needs to do to enable it? Yeah, well, I, I think in, in circularity, it's a especially important policy, and I think it's the enabler for, for it to create a virtuous cycle, because when you're dealing with waste, normally um, there has to be some basic economics for that waste to be... So, so normally waste is a, is a tough uh, thing to do to create some economics to be able to transform and, and, to, and, and to transform it into something else. So I think uh, uh, policy is very important. Uh, we have operations uh, in, in, we are a building materials manufacturer and one of our main levers to reduce CO2 is to, to substitute fossil fuels for solid municipal waste, which is and will become the, the alternative fuel for us uh, now and, and in the future. And uh, although the conversation here is how Europe can be improved, the reality is that Europe is already at a great level compared to other places because of regulation, because at least you have the basic framework in, in which you have created the basic incentives for landfill to be, although you would want it more expensive, it's already quite uh, high compared to other places where it's absolutely very low. No? So that has already allowed for even a whole sector to be created of waste manage specialized waste management companies no? that then can uh, transform it and then uh, provide it uh, to us. 
in in Germany, in Poland, and in the UK, uh, our fuel, generally speaking, in our business, fuel cost uh, is around 30 or 30 to 40 percent of our total variable cost. In Germany, Poland, and, and in the UK, where there's a regulatory framework for circularity, the basic one, where the incentives are, are carefully corrected, carefully drafted, uh, we are uh, paid to get rid of solid municipal waste that is processed. So it has become an income source. And when we reach very high levels of substitution in Poland, we are substituting 90% of our fuels with alternative fuels. Uh, our, we have a, a negative cost, or it's an income, uh, our our item for 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 fuels. No? So that's the power of basic, even the basic policies is very powerful and can really create a a, a big change in waste, com completely changing the way that you see it. Uh, another example in developing countries. Uh, which is very tough to do because landfill costs are very low, there's no restriction for landfilling, etc. You can find very specific situations. Mexico City, uh, 20 million people, it, had, it used to have a big landfill that it was so big and, and it, it became completely impossible to manage. And at some point in time, one authority, um, 10 years ago, decided that that landfill could not take in any additional waste. Just by taking the decision of no more waste to that landfill, all of a sudden that waste had to travel farther. And we were able to put some transfer centers for the waste, and, and we are diverting that waste. And now there is no more um, that part of waste that is inorganic uh, uh, with certain characteristics is no longer going to the landfill because we are being able to divert it just from the economics of going to have having to go further. So with very basic elements uh, in policy, uh, you can make big changes and, and, and make, and make uh, the economics work. And immediately as economics work, then you start, uh, the, the companies start to get involved and, and develop the, the business. Great, thank you. Maybe I have a couple of questions for, for, for the both of you before Anthony needs to leave. So, I mean, it, it, it's really interesting, kind of, make, as you made the analogy between what happens in Europe and also, you know, so CMEX's home market, Mexico, obviously you're, you're operating a number of markets. Do you, do you see scope for European action to be, you know, for, for international collaboration on some of these questions? Because obviously, as we're talking about reinventing value chains, that needs to happen globally as well as locally. Yeah, uh, there, could, there certainly can be collaboration and even at the policy level. We have taken uh, authorities from uh, Latin America to visit uh, operations in Europe, and we have uh, created exchange of experiences between authorities. So even at the policy level, you, you can do that, no? Uh, and, and we are trying to do actually, no? What, what, what we have accomplished in Mexico with the very basic elements, now we are bringing authorities from Panama, from Colombia to, to visit uh, Mexico and to see what can be done with waste. No? So you can do with policy, but you can also do with, with uh, businesses that are dedicated to that. No? So for sure, you can create a whole new business sector based on the experience that is already existing uh, abroad or in Europe, and you can bring it to other markets. No? Uh, last question for you before I get you to pass the mic, because there's a slight kind of uh, logistical thing that we need to navigate. So. Um, I'm interested, you know, you talked about how small changes in policy can enable broader action. And one of the things that we've identified as a key area is financing. Is that something that you would see, you know, do, it seems like you've got various kind of financial um, uh, products um, and engagements. Is that something where you would see that there is an opportunity for green financing to enable further action in this, this area of circularity? Yeah, I think um, I, w I would say that the basic element for any financing is that you have to find the right economics for, for that to be a business. Um, um, and if it's a business, then the fund will support that. No? So, so I think financing, would I wouldn't consider financing to be the bottleneck uh, because if it's a viable business proposition, then it happens. If the policy is not in place and then the economics are not there, 
then you would need some type of grants or or subsidies or something like that. That is a different type of funding, no? Yeah. But but for normal, fi well, financing for this, uh, banks are very eager if there's a business case and if you can demonstrate that it's a viable situation. We we actually do um, use our normal financing to fund projects to invest in in circularity. Um, in the circularity part of our business, and it's very, it has a very high return on investment, and no problem, very, very high levels of, of, and very short paybacks. No? So, if that's the case, then you, financing is not an issue. Brilliant. Maybe if I could pass the mic down, very gracefully. Um, Anthony, if we kind of build on this conversation, you were talking, I mean, I really took from what you were saying these kind of practical examples and this sense of constraints that you were kind of pushing against. If you think to the future, do you, can you, is there a, do you have a, a sense of what a kind of positive vision of success would look like if we're really able to bring these agendas together? And do you think that sense of success might be shared or is it sort of still rather fragmented? No, I think there's an enormous uh, opportunity to share uh, best practice, you know, both within, uh, uh, you know, the European Union, but also outside the European Union. I mean, come with two or three examples that, that I think can um, motivate other countries to drive this agenda. One of them, what's happening in France with the extended producer responsibility system, where you are obliged as a manufacturer to pay into this third party uh, organization uh, and then you get a rebate uh, depending on how much volume you're recycling. So immediately there is a motivation to get these take back systems to work because there's, there's an incentive to do, economic incentive to do that. Another example of something that can drive this is is having thresholds around recycled content. Um, you can keep them low uh, initially and then gradually uh, increase them. But again, that can uh, drive uh, uh, companies like ourselves to look at, okay, what can we do in, with our production processes uh, to, to get that recycled content higher? Because at the end of the day, that will lead to more sales for, for, for our products. So that's another example. And then a third example, which is what we're seeing uh, in the Nordics, I think it's in Norway, I'm not sure whether it's in Sweden, but maybe you, you'll, you'll touch on that, Helen, later, um, is uh, driving zero waste construction sites. Um, and that's you know, particularly coming from the, from the public sector. But immediately, once those requirements are set, then companies like ours will make it happen. You know, we'll make it happen. If, 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 if that is the, the carrot, we'll make it happen. So um, I think there are many good examples that, that is going on in different geographies that can also be uh, uh, utilized elsewhere. And um, one last brief question for you. So you're, you, as you just noticed, you're both from the construction sector, but like the, the task force actually includes companies from technology, from consumer goods, from, also, from finance. Do you, do you see this as a conversation that is sectorally divided or do you think there's a common agenda that cuts across multiple sectors? I, th I think there's a common agenda. Um, you know, I, I, I talk with many other uh, companies with other sectors who have been on this uh, journey within circularity. I mean, look, look at carpets. Uh, there's there's uh, many carpet companies that are able to, to get up to 100% recycled content. So, of course, there are different challenges and different opportunities in different sectors, but there's definitely uh, horizontal generic uh, opportunities and best practices that we can share. So I think there's good opportunities there. Brilliant. Thank you, Anthony. I'll let you get off to your next appointment. Um, and thank you for both of my business speakers. Um, actually, I think we're going to go to Helen next, if that's okay. So, Helen, I mean, I would have started with you, but I, I, I think hopefully it's been useful for you to hear not just me talking about the work that we've been doing, but also some business perspectives. So obviously you're within the Ministry of Environment in Sweden, but you know, obviously you know, a key um, European government, but also shortly to take on the presidency of the European Union. So just, just great to hear your perspective from a, from a government uh, point of view in terms of how you see this agenda going forward. Thank you so much for inviting me and it was really useful to hear a business perspective, certainly. Uh, 
if I could just start by uh, saying that there are so many reasons to go for uh, a more circular economy and not just the climate um, uh, and the global emissions of, uh, of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, but more than 90% of the world, world's water scarcity and biodiversity loss is due to our moving around materials in the way we do. And also there, uh, obviously, it holds uh, a lot of opportunities for business um, to uh, use the resources more e uh, efficiently, not only energy, but material resources too. And as you pointed out, also material security uh, uh, in the um, uh, geopolitical uh, changes uh, we need to uh, look at where where we source our materials and how dependent we are from from different sources so and there has been a lot of points uh, from from uh, business side here um, which I would like to touch upon uh, and a lot of the things you talked about have been implemented in Sweden like ban and tax on landfill, extended producer responsibility, and creating these incentives for business to innovate and, and uh, to uh, improve uh, products and work across uh, value chains. So, but one thing that we are not talking that much about uh, is uh, the tox uh, getting rid of harmful substances in products. If we are going to have a credibility in the circular economy, we need to remove the most harmful substances and get them out of the um, uh, material loops. Um, otherwise, we're in, in, in deep uh, trouble. So that is uh, an important um, thing that we need to uh, put more emphasis in. And it's an interesting um, thing also with the blending in recycled materials and, and gradually increase um, the requirements or, or demand to, to blend in recycled materials. We have done that in Sweden for, for fuels, for example, uh, renewable fuels, um, uh, and uh, that has really uh, created um, uh, innovation in the uh, fuel producers. So they are now going for re total renewable fossil-free uh, production systems. So um, there are um, a lot of things, but one, one, uh, one further thing is to collaborate between the private and public sector and to have that constant dialogue on what is working and what is needed from, from businesses and get the feedback to governments on how to tweak uh, regulations and uh, economic incentives to make it um, uh, economically um, viable to to go in this direction. Brilliant, thank you, Helen. Maybe if I could also take this opportunity to bring Chiara's voice into the room, and then maybe I'll, I'll put a couple of questions to you before we we finish. So, Chiara, um, great to have you as a respondent here, a director of of Can Europe Climate Action Network Europe. So, on behalf of civil society generally, in terms of what you think about this agenda. Thank you, Elliot. And I always like being invited by, by you to this event because I'm learning so many things <laughs> by all these examples. So I think the, the first point I want maybe, I mean, listening to what, what uh, the other panelists said, like, I think the first thing I missed maybe uh, from civil society perspective in the, in the conversation is that we do need the circular economy and the circularity also because it, for me it's automatically linked to the science again. Like if we wanted to limit global warming to 1.5, we don't have other way that a, a circular economy model for the, for the future, actually for the present, if it would be possible. Um, then I think uh, for me it's also important to, to highlight, I, I heard a little bit here and there, but I think to be clear that to me at least and to um, my network, uh, a circular economy also in, not only include energy efficiency and the efficient use of resources, but also some kind of reduction. And I think this is very important to name. I know that can be scary, uh, naming reduction, but especially when it comes to reduction of materials, I think we do have in this space, being a global space, and we do know how much 
our economy so far is based on, on products and materials that are coming from other parts of the world, I think the, the reduction world should be part of the picture, uh, if we like or not. Um, and then maybe, I mean, because of our work, uh, we work in Brussels, looking at the EU, EU uh, initiatives and all of that, I just wanted to flag that there are these coming six months or one year with the Swedish presidency, I think there are key opportunities to push together this agenda and I think we do have the responsibility to do that together. Civil society can do that alone and I think you can also not do that alone as business. I think we do need to push to have a, a very strong, a robust legislative framework that will not allow loopholes on the way forward. I think that's been one of the sort of themes of the last few days in terms of things like the launch of the high level expert group so that you know the action needs to be real and we need to ground it in the right kind of rules so it's been a really important part of the conversation um, maybe if i come back to you helen um it you know we talked a little bit about sort of various things that would drive the um the agenda going forward i want to pick out one specific because it just seems is of interest like as you think about what can drive change through through supply chain, Supply chains. What do you think of the role in terms of product standards as a key tool in EU policy making? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's uh, uh, absolutely key, and uh, also the development of um, eco design directive uh, in Europe now and the proposals that uh, um, we're really looking forward as the EU presidency to uh, to drive that uh, act through uh, through the Council. But one thing also I wanted to mention is um, uh, uh, the colleague from India raised the issue of uh, lifestyles and uh, sort of the consumer perspective here when it comes to both de dematerializing and using materials in, in another way and products. And uh, maybe it's a big step to totally change lifestyle for a single person, but when building new uh, areas um, uh, in urbanization and, and, and totally, then you can build in the prerequisite for going for more sharing economies etc and I think we need to see much more of that as examples and inspiration to go in that direction uh, so building areas which is actually meant for you know you have the carpooling or you have joint products to, to use and share and you have the companies, um, for example, Volvo uh, in Sweden now is going totally for not selling the cars, but to leasing and more uh, upgrading, etc. And having um, you subscribe <laughs> to transportation and not you don't buy the Volvo car. So that could be done in, in, in uh, maybe easier in new housing areas and, and as testing grounds and inspiration. I think that's a really important suggestion and it kind of plays into this kind of whole, I mean, I, I love the, the phrase you use, dematerialization. I think, you know, thinking about Chiara's point, we've got material efficiency, we've got kind of questions around, you know, the demand choices. Um, do you see that as an important, that, that kind of focus in terms of, you know, thinking about which materials we use and whether there are places that we don't need to have the same scale of material consumption? Do you see that as a valuable part of the strategy? Um, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Good, nice, simple answer. That's what we like to hear. I mean, maybe if I can also just kind of bring you back in, Vicente, for a, for a quick... I feel like from our civil society and government voices, we've heard a lot about collaboration. From a business perspective, do you see the value of collaboration in terms of driving this agenda forward? And what do you think are some of the most important partners to collaborate with? Yes, I think collaboration is very important because most of the time the waste uh, follows, is part of a value chain and, and, and if you fix certain parts of the value chain then there's less waste or the waste will go other way, or will flow otherwise. So, so collaboration along the value chain I think is the, is the most important, no? that you identify what are the key elements in that value chain that you have and how waste uh, can be minimized if you are a generator of waste and how waste can be used in a productive way uh, as an alternative raw material or as an alternative fuel. So, so collaboration along the value chain, I think, is the, 
the, the one of the most valuable ones because it's the one that is going to really make a difference in solving a problem or, or radically changing it. No, uh, if you only partner with your equals, uh, you you might be uh, having a little bit of scale, but maybe you are uh, having the same uh, volume of waste uh, anyway. No. Uh, and you just wanted to reflect on, on some of the, the comments that you make. I see that the, I think we have become better at handling waste, but uh, I, the promise of having products that are specially designed for thinking of their end of life and all that, I think we are still far away. And, and that would be, in my opinion, the next generation of how you can really go after the whole circularity, no? the eco design that you mentioned, is that that's the part that I think we are still missing. We have become better at handling waste, uh, for, for obviously in the places where you have all these regulations in place, but, but the next step is how do we generate much less waste and how the end of, uh, and how we design the product so at the end of life is automatically uh, circular and you don't have to figure out what to do with it. No? So I think that's... Uh, Helen Brook, yeah. yeah. If I could uh, comment on that. And um, I mean, uh, we see a lot of innovation and technolo uh, technology development in this area. Um, and um, for example, uh, looking at plastics, it's uh, typically, you know, that uh, the uh, product loses value and you get uh, less and less quality of the um, uh, recycled uh, streams um, along the way. So, uh, w but with new uh, technology to uh, sort of, um, uh, with chemical recycling and you um, uh, break down the polymers and put them together again, uh, you you maintain high quality products uh, to be able to recycle. Otherwise, you you get a downward spiral with with lesser and lesser quality. And that that was my point with the um, uh, hazardous substances in products. It will become more and more more difficult to to recycle if you include that. So uh, we need to put a lot uh, of resources into innovation and, and uh, to maintain quality of the materials. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're, we've, we've kind of overrun and I think possibly run, out, run our time out, although we, we started a little bit late. But I mean, a fascinating conversation. And I think just kind of drawing that last round together, I just kind of note that this conversation has elements of the design thinking, material, you know, technological innovation, but also questions about lifestyles and consumption patterns. And we need to, if we're going to really unlock the potential of this conversation, we'll need to, to incorporate all of those at different elements as we move forward. But there are, I think, you know, if I kind of go back to where, we, where, where this conversation started, there is a huge opportunity, there's a huge win in this place in terms of being able to deliver kind of materials and products that have a far lower environmental footprint that are being able to use in a much more sustainable way, but also potentially offer new value propositions, new uh, lifestyle choices that people could be, could be really valuable. So I've really appreciated our, our panelists. So thank you, join me in thanking them. And thank you very much for, for sticking with us. Thank you. And if anybody wants to, to see our new report, if you, the QR code is a great way to get it. But thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.